Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to HSS 30 Minute Thursdays. Uh, my name is Dr. Theodore Blade, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine specialist at the Hospital for Special Surgery. I've been former team physician for Yale University Athletics. Uh, I'm currently the team physician for the Darien and Stanford High School football teams. Uh, in today's webinar, uh, we have a great topic. We're going to talk uh, about how to stay safe in collision sports, uh, preventing and treating concussions, uh, and the role of helmets and protective equipment. Our speakers today are Dr. Sam Taylor, an orthopedic surgeon at HSS Stanford in New York, uh, and team physician for the New York Giants, uh, and Dr. Warren Young, who is a sports medicine physician at HSS Westchester, uh, and team physician for Iona College uh, and Co Concordia College. Uh, we're looking forward to a very interactive discussion today, so please submit your questions if you have them for our expert panel. Uh, now I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Uh, Taylor, who's going to talk to us about his experience with concussion treatment uh, and especially with his, his uh, experience in the NFL. So Dr. Taylor, take it away. All right. Thank you very much for having me today. It's always fun. I, if we can back up, there you go. So just, you know, a couple of things that, that obviously football is kind of first and foremost in the media um, and has gotten kind of demonized uh, as of late in terms of uh, concussion and concussion risk. You know, I, one of the things as, as certainly somebody who has benefited tremendously from the game of football, I would say that football is more than a game. And if, uh, if we advance that slide a little bit, you'll see a, a really sweet haircut that I had as a, a Greenwich High School football player back in the day. Um, and the lessons that I've learned as a football player have certainly stuck with me over the years. And I think back about one of my mentors, Dr. Steve O'Brien, who in the middle of a, a very difficult case, um, I asked him if he got nervous. This was when I was thinking about going into medicine. And he said, Sam, it's fourth and goal from the two yard line and I want the ball. And so even decades later after football, the lessons learned on the gridiron were really important. So, you know, it behooves all of us to try to, to make the games that we love safer um, it, for all of those that, that participate so we can continue to get all of the wonderful things from these sports. You can advance. And it's not just football. If you look in this video, I want you to watch the referee. My brother actually took this video at a sumo match in Japan. And the referee dips and lands headfirst uh, off, the, uh, off the field of play there, uh, certainly probably suffering from a concussion in his own right. So if we go to the next slide. You know, there have been a number of, uh, number of studies that have looked at the concussion rates, and it's very interesting when, when you look at some of the NCAA uh, data. And, and I just show this just because people, uh, again, want to kind of say that football is uh, the only sport at huge risk for, for head injuries, but it's really a, uh, a problem that we see throughout all different sports. And when looking at concussion rates, what we found was actually football wasn't number one, but uh, football was much further down uh, on the list of, of sports behind men's and women's hockey um, uh, and wrestling actually had, had the men's wrestling had the highest concussion rates. Move forward. All right. So this, you know, this was uh, a couple years ago, one of our giants, uh, games and you're going to see you know this was a rare highlight from a season a couple of years ago and this is uh, Tavares King running down catches a ball it's pretty exciting dives in the end zone everybody's wondering did he get in was it a touchdown was it not you know what you know what you know what do we got going on and then we take a kind of a closer look here on this tight copy and we're going to watch I want you to just keep your eyes on the receiver this whole time as you see him catch the ball and he's going to reach out and dive towards the end zone. And I just want you to watch his, uh, what happens to him after he hits the ground here. So he has what we call a contact seizure, which is where he, uh, he had a concussion here and you can see his arm kind of tense up uh, as he hit the ground. So there's a lot of things that are going on around us all the time. And, and it is upon all of us to be uh, aware of what some of the signs and symptoms of concussion are. You can go next. And so, you know, when we think about sport-related concussion, it's an important problem that we don't fully understand the near or long-term effects. Uh, and it's not certainly not exclusive to football, though it's in the, the, the greatest media light. Go on. In the NFL, um, you can keep coming. 
um, in the NFL, the NFL has done a lot uh, as of recent to try to uh, make the game safer. And, and the NFL has worked very hard with the people that do all of the crash test dummies for uh, to make the motor vehicle world safer to start doing uh, helmet testing. And this information can be found uh, on the NFL's website every year. They, they test helmets. And what they've found is that through their testing protocol, the helmets that are listed in green uh, versus those listed in red um, when you actually look at the concussion rates over the course of a season, there's a threefold difference. So, you know, while while there are, uh, you know, certainly some behavior things that we can do to try to make games safer, which I'm going to talk about in a second, there are also some equipment things that we can do to try and make games safer. Um, and so going through kind of understanding some of the different helmets um, and the safety characteristics can also be an important way to help reduce the risk. The, you know, as I mentioned, the uh, equipment like uh, the helmets and whatnot, but the other thing is going to be kind of behavior patterns. And so the NFL has looked at all of the different concussions over the last several years, looked at all of the video to see, you know, where certain impacts uh, happen, uh, what parts of the helmet strikes occur, um, you know, and position of head and body. You can go next. And they found that. Um, the, basically, the crown, crown or top of the, the helmet to the side of the helmet produces the, the biggest uh, number of concussions. You can keep coming. Um, and, and furthermore, you know, it's not just the helmet to helmet impact, but there's a behavior part of it too. You'll see this player who came down here um, and he, lower, he lowers his body and, and puts his head behind his body, essentially turning himself into a battering ram. You can go to the next slide. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of the rule changes within the NFL have been focused on trying to uh, change behavioral patterns, like you can see here, um, that uh, have been shown over the course of, of years to be um, associated with higher concussion rates. So, you know, again, we can use football to kind of uh, as a, a jumping, a launching point for discussions on other sports. Uh, because of the data that we have gleaned from football. Um, but there are equipment things that we can do to be better. There are also behavioral things that we can uh, certainly do uh, to be better. And, it, and it's on all of us, you know, uh, players, coaches, uh, and uh, physicians and athletic trainers all to try and make these sports that we love safer. So you, you can skip through here. Um, and we'll, we'll skip through that. I don't want to take up too much uh, time. Um, so we can go to Dr. Young. Hey, so Dr. Taylor, let me just ask you before, and I know, you know you're know you under time pressure because you're going to get called away for surgery any minute. Um, but you know what, uh, what do you think the most common mistake is that, that youth athletes make um, you know, in, in, uh, in not preventing uh, or not they're putting themselves at risk really for concussion is it is it that they're wearing the wrong helmet are they wearing it improperly are they is it their technique that they're using i, mean, I know you touched on all of this but yeah no i i mean i i think that so when we talk about the the equipment where you know i think everybody wants kind of a quick fix and think that oh if i buy the if i buy the best helmet then you know concussions aren't going to be an issue and while you know certainly at that nfl level with the higher velocity impacts you know, we have shown that that uh, changing equipment can can be helpful. I think the biggest thing in, in youth sports is really teaching proper technique. Actually, if you look at this slide here uh, that Dr. Young's got, if you look at the rugby player um, on that right hand side uh, with his head down there. So, you know, initially from a behavioral standpoint in football, when I was growing up, they always taught you tackle, you tackle cross face. So you bring your helmet across in the direction that the that the player is going so they have to run through your head well you know that's that's a behavioral thing that puts puts you at risk and so you know as we continue to learn some of these things what we're what we're finding is that this is not a safe technique to be teaching and so the way that coaches are are and should be teaching tackling techniques heads up um, techniques are, I think are the behaviors are the the most important um, things that we can do in youth football and youth sports 
uh, to try and reduce the risk of uh, sport related concussions. And what's and what about your thoughts about um, position? You know, like what, what's the most common position that you see? You know, is is at risk for concussion in football? I know there's been some work uh, looking yeah. at alignment and their risk. And what, what yeah, so, I mean, I think that the the types of forces that people experience in different positions, certainly within football, you know, the lineman is it's a much uh, shorter distance but more repetitive type um, uh, forces that are, that are experienced, whereas your skill players, if you will, your receivers and your defensive backs where there's a higher velocity collision occurring in space, um, tend, you tend to see higher concussion rates uh, among, uh, um, as I recall in the NFL at least, defensive backs had the highest rates of concussion per, um, uh, per exposure. And then, you know, special teams are also a, a big risk. And, and sports have tried to change the way that the rules are to try and reduce the um, the types of impacts that occur to, to um, not allow double teams anymore to change the starting position on a kickoff uh, to try and reduce some of the velocity. So I think it, it's on all of us. I think that as, as players and coaches, we can practice and teach appropriate uh, and safer techniques for, for tackling and um, for contact. I think that as uh, physicians and parents um, and trainers, we can – be more aware and players we can be more aware of what the signs and symptoms are so that we can look out for ourselves and our teammates um, and I think that uh, technology can continue to develop to help uh, all of us make these games safer. Let me just ask you one more question before you know we start Dr. Young and, and in case you have to go uh, I mean are there any specific you, know, you think about practice uh, football practices, you know, we used to run drills like bowling in the ring and, you know, some of, the, some of these things that really put you at risk. Are there any, you know, specific things that uh, that should not be done to really avoid concussions? You know, well, I'll just start by saying I, I, I could never be defeated at bull in the ring, although it was probably <laughs> not the wisest thing to be doing. And, and, uh, and so, I think yeah, I mean, about I, that, right? and, and <laughs> work, so, but, yeah, but, uh, uh, no, I mean, I, I do. I think that there are a number of uh, things that coaches can do to try and limit, uh, you know, limit the types of contacts that can put people at risk. I think that we can start using uh, uh, dummies and blocking bags uh, more effectively to, to teach appropriate um, techniques. I think that and without kind of delving into this whole whole side of it, um, a, an important thing that can be done to help reduce concussions as well in the in uh, the strength and conditioning world is uh, strengthening and training the muscles in your neck, uh, which are actually it can be an extremely uh, helpful way of, of reducing uh, head injuries as well. That's great. We really appreciate your time. I know you're you know we we can excuse you to go check and find out you know if they need you in the operative in the room right now. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'll have to to miss out on it, but. Um, uh, Dr. Young, Dr. Blaine, you guys, you guys rock and, uh, finish this one out for me. Okay. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming in. But yeah, you're, you're, uh, excuse and we really appreciate, uh, Dr. Taylor, team physician, uh, New York Giants. So off you go. All right. All right. Thanks guys. Have a good day. So let's move on to Dr. Young then. Um, and, uh, and hear what he's going to tell us on how to identify concussions and how we treat them. Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm glad to uh, build on what Dr. Taylor talked about. So, you know, we'll talk about, you know, what is the definition of a concussion and you know, how do we diagnose it? And then the, kind of what are we looking at when we talk about returning to play in a safe way? And so as Dr. Taylor talked about, you know, this is not just football. There's many sports that are at risk of concussions and some that you may not even think about. Some of these pictures, I think, on my original slide may not be showing up here. But as you can see, you know, wrestling was, you know, number one on Dr. Taylor's list. That's definitely high. Um, you always think about boxing. Um, soccer is high up there. Basketball is there. Rugby is a sport that is not as popular in the United States, but definitely a high rate of concussion. And then even in uh, cheerleading, uh, we see a decent rate of concussions in cheerleading. And it's not in the flyers, not in the girl that's getting, getting tossed. It's usually in the base. So when the flyer comes down, elbow to the head, uh, knee, leg to the head, um, causing a concussion. So, you know, what is a concussion? Now, the definition of a concussion has changed over the years. 
you know, I've been in practice for 10 years now. And I would say that it's, you know, from when I started as a fellow till now, the, the definition has changed uh, quite a bit. How we describe it now is that it's a traumatically induced transient change or disturbance in the brain function. Um, and it's a complex process. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be started with a hit to the head. It can actually be a hit to the body that transmits forces to the head. Um, and definitely concussion is a subset of a mild traumatic brain injury. Um, and then the signs and symptoms that we see are not explainable for any other reason. And as you can see in the diagram here, there's different forces that get exerted in the brain depending on how, the, how it's hit or how the body is hit. And it's rotational forces as well as direct forces that um, shake, that causes uh, trauma to the brain that can cause injury to the nerve structures the brain structures that disrupt the, uh, the normal function. So next slide. So if you take a look at the brain, um, these are the processes, some of the processes that the, that the brain does. And as you can see, the whole brain is used in various aspects. You know, vision is in the, in the posterior part, decision-making motion in the anterior and the, in the, in the, in the part of the brain. Um, so, and then processing speed is something that the whole brain needs to utilize to be able to do in an optimal way. Next slide. So here are some of the symptoms that we see in concussions, and we can break it down into a couple of categories, cognitive, physical, emotional, and sleep. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and when you take a look at what are the most common symptoms that occur in a concussion, it's headache. It occurs in about 95% of the time. And you don't have to have loss of consciousness to be diagnosed with a concussion. Um, difficulty concentrating, dizziness, and fatigue are kind of second, third, and fourth on that list on, of most common symptoms. But when you, when you take a look at those symptoms as well, you'll see that a lot of them are very generic. You can have those symptoms for other reasons. You can have a cold and have those symptoms. You can just have not slept very well the night before and have those symptoms as well. When you take a look at this graphing, this is taken off um, the American Medical uh, Society for Sports Medicine position statement in 2019. This kind of gives us a, a little bit of an overview you may not be able to see it very well, but it describes the symptoms that we look for into three different categories of, of visual, vestibular, which is balance, cognitive, fatigue, anxiety, and mood, and then headache and migraine. And kind of like a Venn diagram, they kind of come together and there's a mixture of symptoms that can result because every concussion is different in how it affects that individual person. And so they can have different mixtures, they can have a lot of them, and that can, that can affect how we treat them. Dr. Young, can I ask you, um, are there any of those symptoms, like are there different degrees of symptoms, uh, some that are worse than others that might tell you that, that uh, concussion is worse than... than well, that? definitely. So, well, one of the things, and, and this slide um, shows the mandatory s uh, signs of concussion. So when you're, when, you're, um, when you're a sideline physician on a game or you're one of the watchers you know, on the, um, for looking out for injuries that occur, um, the, if you see any of these signs, you're taking the player out of the game because we're pretty sure with very high probability that they just suffered a concussion. Um, so these are what we look for in a game sideline type scenario. Now, in terms of how long the concussion is going to last for and how severely they're going to be affected by it, um, studies have shown that dizziness is actually one of the signs that can predict a longer duration of recovery. And then also, depending on how bad the symptom score is, so we score their symptoms on a scale of zero to six, um, and we look for 22 different symptoms when we, on our checklist. If they have a score that's above 35, typically they're also going to have a longer duration of symptoms as well. And what about, you know, most people are going to remove, be removed from play, you know, and, and won't need to be taken to the hospital. Uh, but, you know, are there cases where, where the symptoms are so severe, the concussion, concussion is so severe that you might consider transport to a hospital. Definitely, definitely. So, you know, when we, when you are a sideline physician you're, or, or any other medical professional on the sideline, when injury happens, the first thing that you look for is you, you don't look for the concussion. You look for something more serious. So our sideline evaluation, you're checking for their level of consciousness. You're checking for their airway, breathing, circulation, and you're mainly you're looking, do they have a brain injury? Do they have a neck or spinal injury? Um, because if you're concerned about that, you're obviously calling 911 right away. You want to get them to the hospital right away. Concussion is more of a secondary evaluation. So the full concussion evaluation is something that if they're otherwise stable, 
we take them out to the sideline, we evaluate them there. Thank so, you. you know, these are the signs. So loss of consciousness, they're, they're motionless. Um, they have amnesia of the event that occurred. They have this vacant look. They're not walking right. They have this ataxia. And then that video that Dr. Taylor showed of the tonic posturing of that wide receiver when he landed um, in that end zone, um, that's that posturing that we look for as well. But most concussions are not as serious as that. And so most of the concussions that do occur are a little bit more subtle. We may not have seen the mechanism. Um, it may have occurred in practice. It may have been due to more sub-concussive hits that occur. So multiple small hits over time that occur during practice, maybe some during games, um, but no real one big incident that you can point to and say, aha, that's what happened. Uh, but then they start having these symptoms. And a lot of times that's when we evaluate them in the office and the athletic trainer may see them in, in the training room. And so we have um, different uh, tools that we use to, do, to assess them. Now, as we had just talked about, you know, that immediate on-field assessment, we're looking for red flag signs of more serious trauma requiring emergent attention. Um, and one tool that we use in terms of going through a checklist of, of uh, evaluation is called the SCAT-5, the Sport Concussion Assessment Tool. And so it's um, in its, I think, like third iteration, even though it's called the SCAT-5, um, and it's, it's validated, it's used the most widely of, of all different types of tests that we use. And most of these kind of online computerized kind of apps are actually utilizing some form of the SCAT-5. To break it down. You know, use the whole, you know, SCAD 5 or, you know, for our team positions on the sidelines, are there, you know, they're like a standard group of a few questions that you might use just as an initial evaluation for somebody with concussion? Oh, yeah. So you're, you're checking for memory, right? You're asking them, hey, you know, what period is it? What's the score? You know, do they remember exactly what happened? You know, where are you? What's your name? You're assessing for their, um, their alertness and their orientation as well. So that's the first sign. And then we go through a number of symptoms. There's 22 symptoms that we look at, to see, that we ask to see if they have it, that will give us a, um, uh, an idea of what's being affected. But you wanna do multiple things. So not only are you checking their symptoms, you wanna check their cognition, their memory, their orientation, their concentration, have them count backwards, um, have them remember, us, you know, have them um, you know, repeat back to us 10 different words ask them again five minutes later um, those same 10 words if they remember, and that's the delayed memory. We do a full neurologic exam, and even more important to really fill out this whole process, the balance test and the vision, the vestibular ocular test are two big ones that um, you never wanna miss because they can have, and I've seen this a lot of times, great cognitive abilities, great concentration. You know, They were a guy or a girl that's way up here you know, at school, they get a concussion, maybe they drop down a little bit, but they're way above average in all these areas. But then you notice that their balance is off or their eyes don't focus correctly, they don't converge correctly. And that's maybe your only tipping uh, sign of what's going on. So identifying these areas of impairment is important because it also helps facilitate a treatment plan depending on what is the affected areas. Uh, next slide. So going back to here, I like this diagram again. Uh, it has a lot of information on here. You may not be able to all visualize this on the video, um, but it also talks about what is the treatment plan for each individual area that's affected. And so um, I, I, I like this um, to just give you an idea of how complex a concussion can be and how it's not all the same. We never treat everyone in the same cookie cutter way because of this. Let me ask you a question about um, about risk factors for a concussion. You know, I've, I've heard it said that, you know, the greatest risk for having a concussion is having already had a concussion. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I th I've also heard, you know, that, that other neurologic symptoms, you know, migraines, et cetera, really can be uh, predictive of, of risk for concussion. What, do you, what are the ones that you really look for? I mean, what, what, uh, what are the risk factors that you worry about? So, um, I look for age. That's one of the main ones. We'll, we'll treat patients differently based on their age. We know that younger, younger kids or kids in general will take a little bit longer to recover than adults. Um, about an 80 to 90% of adults will recover within two weeks from a concussion if this is their first time concussion. Whereas kids, it can take up to four weeks uh, to be for a normal recovery time. And so that's important because if you can give the right um, anticipation and guidance for parents, they're, they're gonna be less, uh, less anxious 
uh, if their if their child is not recovering as quickly as they thought they should be. Um, like they don't recover in four weeks. I mean, I, I think they can go longer in some patients, right? So definitely. What uh, what is a long uh, recovery process? No. Yeah, no, that's a great question. A long recovery. I've seen, I've taken care of kids who took over a year to recover. And definitely, um, the other things I look for is definitely their history. So if they've had a history of concussion, that's number one. But then also, what are the events that happen? I've seen longer recovery and worsening symptoms in patients who uh, got another hit before they were taken out. So it could have been in the same game. It could have been in a back-to-back game. It could have been a couple of days from each other. It just wasn't realized. They had symptoms, um, and then they went to play again. Um, and, and that's usually a, a situation in which it takes a lot longer than I would expect. And I go slower in their recovery process. I, I take them along slower when that is the case. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we're really all trying to avoid that second impact syndrome. And it's interesting as we've learned more about this, you know, things have really changed. I mean, when I was playing and uh, many of us were playing, you know, in our youth, uh, it was common to get your bell rung, right? I mean, you got your bell rung and then you went back in the game. Uh, you get your bell rung now and you're coming out. I mean, that's a concussion. So uh, I think we've learned a lot about this and it's really changed that. And, and I think that that uh, has really lowered our threshold for removing athletes from the game if they have any symptoms at all. I think that's one of the best things to come about it because, um, like I said, I, I see the worst concussions, those situations in which they, they get that second hit. And it's not to the extent that we would characterize them as second impact syndrome, because that's actually a significantly worse issue that can result in coma um, and other and other issues and, and even death as well. But even that second hit that doesn't lead to even as severe symptoms as that can still be severely detrimental to that athlete. Uh, next slide. So um, a little bit about return to play. So, you know, as we talked about, 80 to 95, 80 to 90% of adults will resolve in, within two weeks. Kids will take longer up to four weeks and dizziness and a high symptom score can predict a long recovery. And typically, um, you know, before they can get back into play, they have to go through a six step return to play protocol, which progressives, progressively goes from no activity to full contact activity. Usually there's a, at least a day in between. They ha- can't have any symptoms. And typically we start that when they are improving when they're, they have less symptoms. One of the key things in our, in our treatment that has changed over the course of the past, I would say five to eight years, is that we're, we are now encouraging more light activities, what we call sub-threshold activity that doesn't worsen your symptoms as early as possible, as early as they can tolerate that. And that means like going out for a walk or maybe going on your stationary bike, very low pace, low resistance for about 15 minutes, as long as it doesn't uh, worsen your symptoms, even though you have a little bit of symptoms. That way um, you get a little bit more um, oxygenation, you get a little bit more activity that will help to you to recover a little bit quicker. So, that's what, about, so what about the athlete that you know, maybe can't return to play? I mean, is, is there ever a point where uh, a player has had too many concussions to be able to play their sport again? That's a, oh, that's a great question. You know, we could get into that um, for probably another hour or so um, about the subtleties. Of that. But, but um, and, and that's an area that there's not a lot of consensus either. Um, and so when you're talking about a, con- a collision sport like football and ice hockey, a lot of people will have a number. Um, and But that number may not necessarily keep them out forever. So let's take a 16-year-old who has has had two concussions, but those two concussions were in the same season, um, you know, within a couple of months of each other. A lot, we may take them out for the rest of that season in that scenario. If they have another one right when they get back, even the beginning of next season, um, within that year period, or even within a year and a half period, they may be out for an entire 12 months after that, because now they've had three concussions within a year, um, we're going to keep them out. Um, And that may spell the, uh, the end of their career, depending on how old they are. Um, in other sports, you know, we, you know, non-contact sports, let's say track and field, um, they may not, we may not, um, take them out completely because obviously it's a non-contact sport. And the key, and another thing about concussions, you know, most concussions that occur in kids, especially, they don't occur with sports. Um, only about a quarter, maybe a fifth to a quarter of concussions in kids occur during sport. And I think, you know, our, we're learning more and more about this. So that obviously is, is directing our treatment uh, as we learn more. 
I know you're going to talk about some, um, you know, some resources for uh, people to use to learn more about this. Um, can you talk, you know, before you go to that, uh, what about the role of impact testing? You know, I know that that was something that everybody was using for a while. Are people still really using that? It's every athlete should they do their impact tests and, and what value do you think that has? Yeah, so impact testing. So the impact test is the this computerized test. It goes through um, uh, different processes. So orientation, concentration, fo um, uh, memory, um, it utilizes, you know, reaction time as well to give you either a baseline. So if you never had a concussion, a baseline of what your function is. And then after you've had a concussion, it can be used to detect has there been any change from the baseline. Um, it's been mixed in terms of how beneficial it is. It definitely, a lot of places have used it. A lot of places still use it. It's very easy to get a baseline, but the, even that baseline can be questionable too, um, especially depending on the age of which it's done uh, and how it's done as well. So in someone who's uh, 13 years of age, their, their cognition and their brain function is rapidly still improving. And so their baseline that was done even six months ago may not be their true baseline um, at the time of their concussion. Um, and then also in the environment. So, you know, there have been talks of can the player sandbag and do worse on their baseline so that when they do have a concussion, even though they tried their best, it's still, you know, better or as the same as their baseline. And second, sandbagging, though, is a little bit harder to do. Um, probably the bigger thing is that, you know, your environment, um, you know, how much sleep you got the night before will affect that as well, will affect your test as well. So, um, I don't think it is as useful as um, as it was initially made out to be, and it can be a tool in your toolbox in assessing the patient and athlete. And I use it all the time, especially if their school has already done a baseline. But it's not your definitive test, and it doesn't have any of the visual, ocular, um, and vestibular testing there. So um, I use it as just one tool if it's available, and it's not. It isn't something that I require. That's great. I, I really appreciate that. I wish we had more time to talk. We're getting towards the end. But maybe we could just close with the, I think you were going to mention the resources that other uh, parents and coaches can use. Uh, to learn yeah, so, you know, the, the, the best resource that's out there is the CDC website. It's the Heads Up to Youth Sports. Um, they have a lot of uh, pamphlets there that you can print out for coaches, for parents, and for kids and athletes. Um, a lot of picture diagrams that really explain things really well. They even have, um, you know, we were talking about helmets, right? Uh, helmet uh, information for all the sports of, you know, how you're supposed to use it um, because helmets are important, even though they don't um, prevent concussion, they do help a little bit um, and they prevent worse head injury in all our athletes. Well, that's great. That's excellent discussion, Dr. Young. I really, really appreciate that. Um, it, was, uh, it was really a great 30 minutes that we had here. I really wish we had more time uh, but it's thanks again. To, questions. Yeah, <laughs> thanks uh, for everybody uh, to everybody for tuning in. Uh, if you have any other questions that come up uh, or want to learn more about concussions uh, or HSS, uh, feel free to comment below or to to visit us online at hss.edu. Uh, next week, please also tune in uh, for next uh, thirty minute Thursday topic, uh, which is how to talk to athletes about their weight uh, with our HSS sports nutritionist Heidi Skolnick. So again, thanks everybody. Thanks, Dr. Young, and uh, have a great day, everybody.